bark that's used in, in professional growing media is the material that's found on the outside of the tree. Sometimes the bark is based on, you know, the naming of the bark is based on the type of tree it comes from. So sometimes you'll hear hardwood bark or softwood bark or maybe specifically pine bark uh, in, in most cases. There's different types of bark that are used. Not all bark is equal. In general, hardwood bark is a product we don't generally use in growing media because even though you can go through a composting process, it still can have very rapid breakdown in the container. It tends to tie up nitrogen because as, as it breaks down, it robs nitrogen during the process. And it can also release toxins more so than in some of the softwood barks. So softwood barks, which are used for professional growing media, include things such as spruce, fir, and certainly pine. It has a slightly slower decomposition when it's in the container itself. Uh, you've got a lower level, of, lower starting level of toxins, so you're less likely to see that as an issue, and you get less nitrogen drawdown. Now, in the composting world, there's different, shall we say, expressions that we use. First is what we call green bark. And essentially, green bark is just bark that's taken right from the tree and is used immediately in growing mixes. The problem with that is it tends to tie up a lot of nitrogen. Uh, it hasn't had a chance to really age or get watered, so there's a lot more toxins that are found in there, and it tends to break down very quickly in the container and heats up very, very much. In some cases, I've seen situations where it'll heat up enough, it'll actually kill the plant roots. So we don't really recommend using green bark. It's used sometimes in nursery, which is more forgiving, but certainly not in greenhouse crop production. The next category is what we call aged bark. Essentially what aged bark is, is the pile is basically, there's a pile of bark that sits outside and it sits out there for several months, maybe even over a year. And it does go through what we call a, a composting phase. In, uh, in other words, natural bacteria and other actinomyces fungi will build up in population and they'll start consuming the, the uh, carbon source in there and using nitrogen will actually start breaking down the, the actual bark. So in the end, when it's going through the aging process, you will get less nitrogen drawdown because it's gone through a partial composting phase and you'll see less heating in the pot and usually toxins are not as much of an issue. The last category would be the composted bark. Now, in that case, we could either have it aged and then it's turned, or in some cases, nitrogen is actually added to the bark to stimulate the microorganisms to start the process more rapidly and finish the process more quickly. Typically in that case, and even with aged bark, the piles are occasionally turned, because what happens is as the microorganisms start to break down the bark, they generate a lot of heat. And of course, in a pile, you can generate so much heat, it can actually cause a fire. So it's good to turn the pile to reorient the microorganisms to get uniform composting in the bark. Essentially, the goal there is, is we look at the temperature, look at oxygen, the pH, and EC are monitored to make sure the product is composting properly, and the goal is to take it from, let's say, a starting carbon to nitrogen ratio of 200 to 1 down to maybe a 60 or an 80 to 1 ratio. Now, of course, the more broken down the bark is, as, we, as it goes through the process, you go from big pieces down to smaller pieces. So if you actually take bark and compost it down to its finished point, it's actually going to be a pile of dust. So we, we don't quite go that far. And of course, this type of bark is going to have almost no nitrogen tie up in the container. There's absolutely no heating and no issues with toxins. Now, as far as the size of the bark that's used in growing media, we can see a sample of some of the bark here. The size of the bark really depends on the application. So for instance, for bark that's used in nursery applications, generally it's screened at three quarters of an inch or two centimeters and minus. For greenhouse growing media used in larger containers, usually it's screened at half inch or possibly three eighths inch minus, meaning it has everything from the large particles down to the fine. And of course, there's also an expression which we call bark fines, in which the the peep, or the I'm sorry, the bark is screened quarter inch or minus. So the physical properties of the bark depends on the size. So for instance, we talk about coarse bark, as I mentioned, we use in nursery mixes. The larger the chunk, the more aeration it's gonna to introduce to the growing media, and certainly it's gonna greatly reduce the water holding capacity. So chunky bark tends to have a very, dry, very rapid dry down, so you can water it more frequently. You don't have to worry about rain events, uh, overwatering it. It's very difficult to overwatering. 
So as a result, you get very few root issues from root disease or struggling growth. Now if we go to the opposite extreme to a real fine bark, so quarter inch minus, what we see there is that the growing media is actually going to retain more water because the, the bark itself, because it's finer, it tends to lock in the water a little bit more. It still has pretty good aeration, but again, for the water holding capacity to be increased, you compromise a little bit on the aeration. So you get a slower dry down of the growing media so it doesn't have to be watered as frequently. Uh, but of course, you got to watch that you don't have too many bark finds because lack of uh, too much bark find or too many bark finds can produce lack of aeration, which can cause problems with your root growth and possible root disease issues. Now, often in professional growing media, the preference is to use a coarse uh, bark source. Again, in nursery, three quarter inch minus, and in greenhouse, in these type of applications, half inch to three inch minus. So again, it has the best of both worlds. If you use the product with, with the minus, meaning that you have the larger pieces with the finer pieces as seen in this sample. So it'll give you the best of both worlds. So you get still the water holding as well as the aeration. It doesn't dry out quite as rapidly, which is good. But the main reason why most growers will use bark uh, for applications such as larger containers in the greenhouse, or as I mentioned, nursery, we don't use bark in small containers. You can use it in cell packs, but you certainly can't use it for seed germination applications. So again, the reason bark is used is it has high bulk density, meaning it has a lot of weight. So when used in outdoor production where it's most commonly used, your pots don't tip over as easily when the plant gets blown by the wind. It tends to resist compaction, especially if it's aged or composted. So you don't see that loss of volume over time, but it can be slightly hydrophobic. So it's a good idea to add a wetting agent just to make sure it wets up properly with water. As far as the chemical properties of bark, the electrical conductivity or the amount of fertilizer and other types of salts that would naturally be found in bark has an EC of about 0.5 millimoles per centimeter or less. Uh, it does provide some plant nutrients. It's mostly ammonium, maybe a little bit of manganese, but essentially it's kind of negligible in the amount. So again, you'd want to apply fertilizer based on the needs of the crop. If it's improperly composted or if it's green bark, it's going to be quite different. It's going to have a much higher uh, EC, so it's going to be above 2.5. You can end up with ammonium and manganese toxicity issues just because they're at high levels and cause crop damage. So it depends on where the composting process is there. pH, the bark is a slightly, a slightly acidic or could be quite acidic, anywhere from a pH about 4.5 up to 6.5. The more composted it is, the higher the pH will be. So you will add some limestone to adjust the pH. Um, and that's actually a good thing because again, we don't like to see the pH of the mix drop real quickly. So the, the lime will buffer that drop in pH. It has a low to moderate cation exchange capacity, meaning again, the ability to retain nutrients. It's not real high. Again, I wouldn't count on that giving fertilizer back to the plants. But uh, again, as I mentioned with the EC, again, you want to apply your fertilizer as you normally would. It's pretty much free of any kind of chemicals or herbicides. Again, it depends on where the plants or where the bark source came from. Uh, it could, and most bark sources are usually pretty low in toxins, but again, if it's not properly composted, it may have some high levels of, of natural toxins that come from the mix or come from the bark. Now, the biological properties, bark has a very high level of, of, or a high population of microorganisms. Again, most of these are good microorganisms. Some actually contribute towards disease suppression. Having a lot of microorganisms in the media is good because it actually crowds out your pathogens so they're less likely to create issues. And by the way, there are no pathogens that really come from bark as the heating process usually kills those off. One factor to consider with a high microbial population is they do tend to break down the wetting agent faster. That's why we recommend using up bark media within six months to avoid issues with, with slow wettability of the growing media. And again, bark, because it is biologically diverse, it's also a great environment to add our biological additives, such as our active ingredients, our biofungicide and mycorrhizae.